I once suggested to John Fuang that he should write a book on breath meditation. He said there was no need for it. John Lee had already written the book, had all the basic principles. So I told him, there's more to breath meditation than just the principles. There are a lot of little details that a John Fuang had that he couldn't find in a John Lee's book. He said, they're there. They're in the principles. And it's part of our own training in discernment to learn how to take the principles and apply them to our particulars, the particulars of our suffering or our problems as we meditate. If you have everything handed to you, as many of the Forrester Johns will say, they didn't learn how to fix your own food. Don't learn how to do things for yourself. And John Mahabhu made a similar observation about a John Mun. He said a John Mun would give you the trunk of the tree, and you'd have to work out the branches. You look at the Buddha's teachings, and he talks about suffering. He gives a long list of the different kinds of suffering there are, but then he boils them down to five clinging aggregates. It's not an intuitive teaching, but it gives you the basic principles. And from there you work out the details. If there's suffering in the mind, you're clinging in one way or another to one of these five activities. And seeing them as these five activities, seeing the different forms of suffering you have in these terms, helps to give you some distance from them. After all, that's a large part of discernment, is learning to see things as separate. Because when you look at the categories, they're all pretty broad, especially fabrication. I mean, all kinds of things come under the category of fabrication. All the different ways you think about things, all the different ways you talk to yourself about your suffering, that's all fabrication. And the Buddha can't go in and detail every possible way that people can talk to themselves about their suffering, because a lot of it has to do with your language, a lot of it has to do with your culture, your personality, the things you pick up. Even people in the same situation or a very similar situation to you can pick up totally different things. I remember talking to my brother one time about the sort of implicit messages that were being taught by our parents. And granted, we were five years apart. But still, I was amazed that he was picking up messages that I didn't pick up, and I was picking up messages that he didn't pick up. So there's that karmic receptivity that's also at play. So when you think of all the different variations of what the mind can do, as the Buddha said, the human mind is more variegated than the animal kingdom. You think of all the different species out there and all the different types of animals. They all came from mind. The mind thought, wouldn't it be cool to be a lizard? Wouldn't it be cool to be a frog? Wouldn't it be cool to fly up and down and back and forth? You'd become a hummingbird. And the mind is more variegated than all those animals out there. So there's no way that the Buddha is going to detail all the types of suffering, but he will give you the major categories. And seeing things in terms of those major categories helps pull you away from them. Because one aspect of our suffering is that we want to have somebody acknowledge the details, the particulars of what you are suffering from at a particular time. There's a part of the mind that wants to have somebody else there acknowledge, yes, that really was suffering and really is something to feel sorry for, and that people pity you. Feel compassion, feel empathy, sympathy. Well, that's nostalgia. We're nostalgic for our suffering. And one of the qualities of the Third Noble Truth is analio, which means you let go of your nostalgia. You don't want to ruminate over your old sufferings again. You want, you've got to realize you've had enough.
So on the one hand, you do have to take the larger principles and figure out how they're going to apply to your particular issues. But once you've got the particular connection, then you want to pull back out again and see, okay, these are just aggregates. This is just clinging. That's it. It can be clinging to a sense of self. It can be clinging to a particular views, clinging to your sensual desires, clinging to your habitual ways of doing things. It involves the five aggregates, and that's it. The more you can depersonalize a situation, the more you can pull out of it. It's like those issues with people coming and saying harsh things to you. But as you depersonalize them by saying, on the one hand, you know, an unpleasant sound has made contact at the ear. How many times when someone's been yelling at you do you just think in those terms? An unpleasant sound is making contact at the ear. You pull it into your heart and create all kinds of narratives around it. You personalize it, and by personalizing it you make it painful. You depersonalize it, just, it's just that unpleasant sound. Or in that list that the Buddha gives of the different kinds of harsh speech. There's harsh speech and there's kind speech. There's true speech and there's false speech. Timely, untimely. So when people address harsh words to you, you have to realize, so this is just part of the way speech is. This is the, one of the characteristics of speech in the world. And that depersonalizes it. And you don't have to go back and ruminate over the particularities of precisely how it was outrageous that that person said that. We're here to learn how to dismiss things and not let them fester inside. So try to see where the Buddha's larger teachings is. As the John Mahabha would say, the, the trunk of the tree that you get from the teach, from the Buddha. Okay, how can you work out the branches of that particular tree so that they are helpful to you? And then once you've got the particulars, and then you trace it back to the trunk to pull yourself away. That's how you learn how to get over your nostalgia for your suffering. It sounds strange, but that's a lot of it, the suffering that we carry around. We're still very much nostalgic for old things. It's like our memories of childhood. Maybe there was a stain on the kitchen, kitchen wall where you grew up. And simply because that was part of your childhood, that stain becomes something that you treasure. particulars of your suffering when you were a child. Those stick with you, and there's part of the mind that wants to go over them again and again, and yet people like to talk about them. They want to have them acknowledged. Or you can acknowledge them to yourself and then just move on. Otherwise you keep coming back to the same old suffering again and again and again. So don't get nostalgic for the details. realize that this quality of nostalgia for suffering is one of the things that keeps you trapped. When you've decided you have enough, then you can let go. And the Buddha shows you the way out.